Lesson 11 for August the 15th, 2021, Unit 3, Faith Gives Us Hope. Our subject, Keep Going. Our devotional reading, the 40th Psalm, verses 1 through 13. Background scripture, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 39. Our lesson print, Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 36. Our key verse is the 23rd verse from the 10th chapter of Hebrews. And the King James Version reads, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. The author states, as a result of experiencing this lesson, we should be able to explore the stories of the early believers who suffered for the sake of their faith. Secondly, resolve to endure suffering that results from your faithful witness. And lastly, share in the sufferings of Christians around the world. Our reading will come from the New Living Translation. And even though our lesson does not include that 22nd verse, I like to include it in our discussion. And again, this is the New Living Translation. And it says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. And that 23rd verse says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. So we see here that um, today's lesson is coming from the book of Hebrews. And the author of Hebrews is still being questioned. Some want to say Paul had something to do with it, even though he's not the main writer. And uh, theologians, of course, speculate on others, but they're not sure who wrote it. But my attitude about that is it really doesn't matter exactly who wrote it because we do indeed believe that whoever wrote it, they was led by God, they was God's secretary, if you will, in writing the words that we find in the book of Hebrews. But we, uh, today's lesson is also dealing with the priest. The priest came from the tribe of Levi, and Levi um, is named for, he was the fourth son of Jacob by his wife Leah. And uh, that's where we get our 12 tribes from, Jacob's 12 sons. And that doesn't mean that everybody from the tribe of Levi was a priest, but you had to be from that tribe to become a priest. And Aaron, if I'm not mistaken, Moses' brother was the first Levitical priest. And even the priests, they had certain days that they were assigned to go into the inner part of the temple of the Holy of Holies, it was referred to. And if it wasn't their turn and they went in and violated the schedule, for the lack of a better word, then that they paid the debt with their lives. But uh, our lesson, um, our verses, and I included verse 22, um, that starting with the 19th verse, the subject is a call to persevere. And even in today's times, we as Christians, we are, my expression is, the world view us through critical eyes, meaning they look for the errors or the mistakes that we make. And sometimes they look and try to find something to hold up to you to make us think that we're not perfect. But the thing about it is, we already know that we're not perfect, that we're just sinners saved by grace. And these, and every day we're trying to do better than we did the day before and leaning and depending on the Lord to strengthen us in our area of weakness and of course to forgive us of our sins and also strengthen us that we don't commit those same sins again. And then that 23rd verse, it tells us to hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Now, the thing about it is once God has done something for us and faith is born because of God's intervention, if you will, there should be nothing 
to come along and nobody to come along to make you waver in your faith. But sometimes the devil, he's, he's not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. He's very smart and he knows who we're at our weakest point. So he kind of waves the red flag, if you will, and trying to make you doubt God and your faith. But we got enough evidence, at least we should, in our own personal lives. And we should stand, my grandmother would say, flat foot and know that God is going to do just what he said he's going to do. Then that 24th verse says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And I think that's a struggle for a lot of us that it's sometimes seemingly easier for us to pull each other down than to prompt each other up. But the thing about it is if people can see how God deals with us in spite of the, the negative things that people throw at us and that we can still hold our head up high and be positive because we know that on the cross, Christ said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we realize that some people know exactly what they're doing when they come for us, if you will, but we can still pray for them and kill their hate or their evilness with love. And they said love will not only deter evil and hatred, but it can turn it completely around because you have to have the real love of Jesus to even be able to do for your family, friends, and enemies when they've uh, turned their back on you and even when they've mistreated you, you can still go on in the name of Jesus knowing that he sees and knows everything that's going on. And then that 25th verse it says, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, I want to go back to that King James Version on that verse because a lot of us quote that verse, but I don't even think we really know what it means. Now, the King James Version says, not forsaken the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting, meaning urging, encouraging one another, so much the more as ye see the day approaching. You know, I don't know about anybody else, but I've said it many times, that the rougher my week is, the quicker I try to get to church on Sunday, and that's where it used to be since COVID. We hadn't assembled here in our sanctuary in over a year. But the thing about it is that you still, we have to realize too, the people, we're the church. The building we assemble ourselves in for Bible study, choir rehearsal, and morning service or whatever uh, activities you're having, that's the edifice. Because we can turn this building into anything, but it's all in about us, excuse me, coming together. Now, and some people are of the conviction that they can look at the different ministers on TV, but we see here God contradicts that. He's saying, forsake not the assembly of ourselves together. And when we come together, when we realize it or not, we encourage one another, we strengthen one another, and we never know what a person has gone through to even, for them to be able to make it to church. And that's why we need to be careful how we treat one another and share with people the things that God has brought you through and what he's brought you to. And that will sometimes encourage someone else. They may be at the end of their rope. You may never know it, but when you give them words of encouragement, share your testimony with them, then you give them the strength and the desire to go on just a little bit further. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Then that 26th verse says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Now, Numbers 15 chapter verses 22 to 31 is a reference point for that particular verse if you are so interested. Now, we see here that we, and I find myself quoting it too, to much is given, much is required. And that doesn't necessarily mean just material things, but that means knowledge and wisdom too. As we know better, God expects for us to do better. Now, you don't expect for a new Christian to be able to stand some of the stuff that a seasoned, if you will, 
Christian can handle because they've been on the battlefield for a while. And for the most part, most of us have gone through some things to kind of put a rubber stamp, if you will, on our faith and our determination. So, and also we need to realize that grace is not a license to sin. And there's a difference in how God deals with us for those who do things out of ignorance and those who deliberately plot to do things. And God's got your number. He got our number. So we need to know that. And we need to refrain from plotting and doing stuff deliberately that is wrong. So we need to know, as I just said, God is mother going, used to say God is looking and booking. Then the 27th verse says, there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now the references for that is Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, verses 2 through 6. So even though God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, God expected for us to follow those. But then when Christ came, and remember I said earlier, the priests had certain days assigned to them that they could go into the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, if you will. And while they were in there, they asked God to forgive the sins of the people. And I often say that sometimes their list of sins may be longer than mine. So they may forget what they will be asking God to forgive me for. And that's why one of the reasons God sent Christ now, we can go to God anytime, anywhere, and pray on our own behalf. And if you don't, let me encourage you to have an active prayer life. Now, I don't know about nobody else, but if it wasn't for, for prayer, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. Thank you, Jesus. So we need to recognize and realize and see, let's not miss that part of the 28th verse says, it says that without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In that verse that we often quote that where two or three are gathered together uh, on one, with one accord, then God said he'd be in the midst. And that's actually talking about when you are in a disagreement with your sister or your brother. And it's telling us here we need to have witnesses. And God has even said in his word, even, you know, some churches take uh, their business or legal issues downtown. God said that those type of people should not be settling or handling things in this house. We ought to be able to handle that among ourselves. And we need to remember that uh, if you know if anybody's talking about doing that kind of thing. But then that 29th verse says, just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who bring God's mercy on us. So when we deliberately plot to sin and do wrong, it's like Christ died for nothing. It's like we don't hold it to high honor or anything. It's like, so, so what? He did that. But he did it for all of us and we need to be mindful of our attitude and actions often speaks louder than words and uh, one of the deacon I used to know, he said, words will let anybody use them. But we need to be mindful of what we say and definitely of what we do because God sees and knows all. We don't have to worry about him getting us confused with nobody because he knows us by name. That 30th verse says, for we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And you, that's Romans 12 and 19. For God has already said, vengeance is mine. And so the thing about it, we know God is displeased with certain things and we still habitually do it. God is going to deal with us on his terms because he knows we know better. And sometimes, you know, people say, well, I didn't know that. And I used to think that everybody have had access to the word of God. They may have had access to the word of God, but now I question, was it accurate? Because there are a lot of people who don't understand the word themselves and they try to teach it. And we have to wait for the Holy Spirit to give us utterance, even when we call ourselves and we use the word teaching. 
um, when we're expounding, if you will, on the word of God. You have to save room for the Holy Spirit to minister to you as you minister to people. Then the 32nd and 33rd verse says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule, were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. So I don't know about anybody else, but sometimes those closest to you is who try to make a mockery of your belief and your commitment to God. But we can't let that deter, deter us. We got to keep going even more with more determination in the name of the Lord. And I can stand here and tell you without hesitation that the Lord will give you the strength. And when they come for you, he'll even give you words to put them in their place. And you don't have to use not one not curse word, curse word to me, I call that cute cussing, but you don't have to use not one cuss word and you can put them in their place and you can go with your head high knowing that you let them know this is not just a game to me, it's a ministry, I'm determined to do things God's way. And that's not to say that we don't uh, fail and falter sometimes, we do, but we can always go to God and ask for forgiveness and ask for strength. And we have to be sincere in our asking and believing that he's going to do just what we're asking him to do. Then the 34th verse says, you suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all your own was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. And that's why it tells us, don't build our treasures up here on earth. Because this place is not our home. This actually is the land of the dying. And we're on our way to the land of the living, providing you have a relationship with Christ. And so we see here, even in the biblical times, these people were mistreated. Some of them even lost their life because of their faith and their testimony. So if they did it back then, what do we expect some people of the world are going to treat us? And like I said, sometimes those people of the world are blood kin to you, and they don't understand, but you, you can try and explain it to them. But I often say, even when people come to you with questions, know what their motives are. And I was talking to a young lady the other day, and she said, whatever it is that we do, before we even start doing it, we need to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Even if you're changing your eating habits, trying to lose weight or made a new determination about going back to church or doing better uh, towards God and all that, why are you doing it? Are you doing it for out of real reason or are you doing it because you're trying to please somebody else? And we need to be in tune and in touch with self and be honest with ourselves even when we're asking these questions because sometimes instead of us getting better, we'll get worse because we're not real about what it is that we're doing. And then verses 35 and 36, it says, So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but right now. So that you will continue to do God's will then you will receive all that he has promised. And what good thing about it, can't nobody get what God has for you. You're the only one that can put it on hold or lead God to putting it on the shelf out of your disobedience. So we need to recognize, realize, consult God and ask him, Lord, what it is that you will have me to do. And let's take on the attitude of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 and 8. Lord, if you need somebody, here am I. Send me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning thanking you, Lord, for all your many blessings. And Lord, we know that Hebrews 11 and 1 it said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But Lord, you've already shown us your power. And Lord, let us lean and depend and rely on that. Let us not forget that. Because, Lord, the devil will come for us and trying to make us doubt you. But, Lord, as the song says, before I take it back, I'll add more to it. Because, Lord, you've been just that good to me. Lord, I can't speak for nobody else, but I know what you've done for me. And for that, I just want to say thank you. 
And Lord, I know I can call on you when I can't call on nobody else. And Lord, for that, I just want to say thank you. And Lord, I've been with you long enough now to know is that purposely you fix it so we can't get in touch with nobody else. Because you're telling us I'm, I've been waiting on you. And Lord, you want us to bring it to you in prayer. And Lord, for that, I just want to say thank you. And Lord, we know that you're all seeing and all knowing. Lord, you know what we need even before we ask. You know what we've done before we bring it to you. But Lord, I also know that you want us to know that we've done wrong, Lord, and you've got feelings because you've already said in your, that you are a jealous God and that we should have no other God before you. Because Lord, can't nobody do us like you. And Lord, for that, we just want to say thank you. And Lord, John 3.16 says it all. How much you loved us that you gave your only begotten son. That all we got to do is believe. And Lord, once we believe, faith is the first block that's laid. Lord, and for that, we just want to say thank you. And Lord, we know that you were the stone that they rejected. But now, you're the head cornerstone. And Lord, for that, we just want to say thank you. You're telling us, Lord, that we who belong to you, Lord, we need to look at your life. The world didn't accept you, Lord, so what make us think the world is going to accept us? But, Lord, we got to keep on going in your name, yet holding on and yet trusting and believing and knowing that there's nowhere we can go that you won't be right there. Lord, I think it was David that said, if I make my bed in hell, you'll be there too. But, Lord, I'm doing my very best to go nowhere near there. But, Lord, every day I'm sending up my temper because one day, Lord, I want to behold your face. Lord, I don't know about sitting down, but Lord, I want to walk all over heaven. Lord, I want to walk on the streets that are paved with gold. I want to put my hands on the pearly gates. But Lord, I know I've got to walk the path that you've laid. And Lord, I need to stay in the lane that you've paved just for me. And for that, I just want to say thank you. Lord, I'm asking you to look on our pastor and his wife, Lord, and not only our pastor and wife, Lord, but ministers and their wives and companions everywhere. Lord, strengthen them and prop them up on every leading side. But Lord, this is our Women's Month. Lord, I'm asking you to touch us as well. Let us walk on and Lord, do those things that you've assigned into our hand to do because all of us got a place in Kingdom Builder. And then Lord, when it's yours to call and ours to answer. These and other blessings I thank and ask you for in your darling son Jesus' name. Thank God and amen.